Today's sessions are a bit longer than yesterday, but we hope that we're going to learn a lot together. And I am actually going to be introducing the first session because I'm presenting on it. Um, and just a bit my pardon, just a bit about myself. I am Naledi Mpanza. I'm a master's graduate from the University of Pretoria, and I'm currently working as a researcher at the Center for Sexualities, AIDS, and Gender. Yesterday, we started talking about elements of social justice. We leaned on disabilities in some aspects, and we unpacked a bit about social, um, sexual reproductive health and rights. We spoke about um, the decolonization of institutions and the digital divide. I'd like us to please now bring our focus back to the work that be that's being done at the University of Pretoria. And some of this includes, especially under the Just Leaders program, social justice, gender justice, amongst others. So with this presentation, I would like us to please, um, yeah, just prepare to engage. We're going to be mentioning very interesting um, topics, developments in the university space, and I'm hoping that we'll have questions to engage with at the end. Right, so what I'm hoping we'll get out of today's presentation is a bit about the Just Leaders program. I'll explain what the social justice barometer is, and then I'll introduce something which the Center of Sexualities, AIDS, and Gender has worked on alongside the Center for Human Rights, something called the UP's Transgender Protocol. So before we get into that, I'm just going to run through a few definitions um, around gender and social justice. Right. So before we even get into that, there's quite a bit of terminology that we need to understand so that we situate ourselves, right? In our space, it's a bit more common, but for some people, this may not come as second nature as you might not be necessarily involved in this space. So some of the terms I'd like you to please check on the screen at the moment would be terms such as gender, queer, and non-binary. So in order to understand this, we could say it's a catch-all category for gender identities that are not exclusively male or female, so identities that go beyond what we are in a society that's heteronormative and um, told to basically believe. So it definitely goes against our current society's um, ways of socialization in most cases. Um, it basically sorts to, seeks to destroy the binaries that we're told about. Um, and yeah, so people will identify on that spectrum. And yeah. And then also transgender is a term for people who have a gender identity and often a gender expression that's different to the sex and assumed gender that they were assigned at birth by default on account of their primary sexual characteristics. You can also just take time to read through what's on the screen right now, but these are just the basic terms which I'd like you to understand as we're going forward. I am dedicatedly not going to use um, uh, heteronormative language as we're trying to expand our understanding of what gender and sexuality could be. Right. So the Just Leaders Program, just to share a bit, the Just Leaders Program is a flagship of the CSANG. So what basically happens in the Just Leaders Program is it's a volunteer and leadership um, project that involves quite a few volunteers. Our database of volunteers is over 200 at the moment. And I actually joined the Just Leaders Program when I started my master's year at the University of Pretoria. We got there and we did the nine-week entry-level training, which is available still today um, online because of COVID. And what happens there is we deal with a variety of topics that have to do with social justice, gender justice, and inclusive practices. It's very fulfilling and at the moment, we provide many opportunities for our volunteers to become befrienders who are HIV, voluntary HIV in, um, testing and counselors. Uh, we provide community engagement opportunities with us, Belinda, who spoke yesterday. Um, who shared her insights yesterday um, during the SRHR panel and quite a few other activities which really do seek to promote social justice, critical consciousness and inclusive practices that will co-create university environments that are responsive and trans transformed by just leaders. Right. So coming to the social justice barometer. The social justice barometer is one of the projects which we sought to complete or engage in as the Center for Sexualities, AIDS, and Gender. We may understand a barometer as something that measures, you know, a bit of a science there. Um, a barometer is something that measures something. 
So with the social justice barometer, it's exactly that. We're trying to measure social justice in different entities. So what we tried to do is we had a document developed in order to try and figure out different ways um, of understanding where an institution is in terms of its inclusive practices. So more specifically, the Just Leaders had a few focus areas, but most importantly, it was the social justice barometer and conducting and disseminating research to contribute to more exclusive societies, inclusive societies and university spaces. So the document is basically a questionnaire in three sections, and the three sections are gender justice, reproductive justice, and reproductive health justice. I need to edit that. So each section has a commentary option that allows for elaboration at the topic of hand. So there's a set of questions and then at the end, it's supposed to be presented as a workshop and in that workshop, then people would provide um, the blind spots areas or the gaps in the topic that would be in each section. So what it aims to do is to guide real is to guide people in social justice matters and is meant to be an instrument to assess the university spaces that are not exclusive to the University of Pretoria, pardon. So we did pilot the social justice barometer at the University of Pretoria with our volunteers and then we created a document which would be um, refined and shared in future publication. And there's quite a bit that we found out. I'll be sharing the findings a bit later in the slide. All right. So to understand exactly what we were going into with the social justice barometer, I'd like us to first understand what these particular topics or spaces would mean. And this is work which is pretty familiar to the programs that we run under the Just Leaders program and at the CSANG broadly. So I'd like us to please bring our attention to gender justice. And please, as I'm giving you definitions from the World Health Organization, from the UN, from the AU, from all these policies, please also think about your social experiences and what you might think gender justice is. And we'll definitely be engaging on this a bit longer, a bit later, because I'll try and keep this longer presentation shorter for more engagement. So with gender justice, gender refers to the characteristics of women, men, girls and boys that are socially constructed. In other words, we are socialized into gender. Gender is not something that you're born with, right? Yes, we've got gender reveals, but it's a very, I mean, this is personal, no one can hold me to it, but there is some people would share the opinion that it is an imposition of sorts, right? Because the child is not biologically <laughs> gendered. It's something that we need to teach them, them the characteristics, with the clothes they wear. It's, they're not born knowing which clothes they're specifically meant to aspire or commit to per se. So gender is very much socialized. So it includes these norms and behaviors and roles associated with being a woman, a girl, a boy. Um, you have colors, you have um, characteristics, you have activities which are imposed on people which they're socialized into. Um, people would argue that they've got reproductive, so they've got very important sort of reproductive ways of trying to situate people's personalities. But at the CSNG, we do believe it's a socializing um, agent, it's a social construct that does not necessarily mean a person cannot differ from it. So gender justice then would be a world where people, everyone, women, men, boys, girls, transgender, intersex people, people who are non-binary, genderqueer, are valued and are able to share equitably in the distribution of power, knowledge, and resources. So in other words, gender justice can be defined as the systemic redistribution of power, opportunities, <coughs> and access for people of all genders through the dissemination, or dismantling rather, of harmful structures including patriarchy, homophobia, transgender phobia, and similar terms like racial justice and climate justice also form a part of the space of engaging, <coughs> pardon, on gender justice. So some of the findings um, on gender justice at the University of Pretoria and the social justice barometer were that the students found that there are symbols, practices, rituals, ceremonies, opportunities, media presence, and everyday experiences that link to the culture, to li that link to gender and the culture justice um, that students feel on campus. Um, and they also felt that culture is not inclusive of all people across the gender spectrum. In discussion with students, it was brought up that the only time that people who were transgender, intersex, non-binary, and genderqueer were only catered for during Pride Week where differences were openly celebrated. So this is not a dig at the University of Pretoria. Our only sample were students at the University of Pretoria. And as you will see later on in the presentation, this is not a unique situation to our institution. 
we do have studies that have been conducted on trans students in different universities all over South Africa, and this is one particular uh, comment or issue that was shared that these differences that we talk about on a regular basis seem to only be celebrated in specific times. And when we think back to, for an example, um, World AIDS Day on the 1st of December, which is the only time you'd find a lot of people wearing the AIDS ribbon. You know, there is a critique about that being um, a very icky sort of situation where we would not like to continue a behavior where we celebrate differences or important moments with one day, right? And then just a bit more about gender justice. Part of the activism around creating gender sensitive spaces and institutions has definitely arisen from feminist approaches that favor the prioritization of the marginalized who suffer under gender blind policy and practice. And I'm confident in saying that because I cited it in my research. And what I'm basically saying there is that feminist literature is definitely, definitely something or definitely an approach that has helped us understand many of our inclusive practices. For people who do research, there's something called participatory action research, where we seek to engage participants in the information sharing, information development process, which includes the social justice barometer, which was developed with students with a variety of people who identify broadly on the spectrum. So although some of the concerns regarding gender justice have tended to focus on women in the past, gender justice has also included men in instances such as HIV, AIDS, healthcare, and provision of condoms for male and female students in universities. There is a growing concern, there is a, a known concern that men tend to be excluded from interventions around their healthcare, around gender justice. But the feminist approach we do take is that feminism is meant to empower both men and women. And as mentioned earlier, we're trying to deconstruct patriarchy, which does not only influence and impact women, it also impacts men and people alike. So it goes without saying that this conversation on including, on inclusion, um, and the tailored responses to trans, has tailored, pardon, it goes without saying that in a conversation on inclusion, tailored responses to transgender people as well as people that identify across the gender spectrum need to cater to and include them in the processes that address their health issues and the support, support systems need to be competent. So this was a finding by the Trans University Forum, which I believe is one of the more comprehensive studies in South Africa on trans people. So what they were basically saying is at the moment there is very few competent staff and very inefficient referral systems that make it very difficult for trans people and other students who are gender queer to access these services. And gender justice is basically trying to address this. So research is us becoming aware of these blind spots or gaps and then action would be in trying to find staff that are competent to help in healthcare centers for students and people alike, and also then to have referral systems that are effective. Right, the second part is reproductive health justice. So working definition of this would be, it includes all matters related to sexual and reproductive health and rights. It's acknowledging sexual and gender diversity and that hetero and cis normative patriarchy and structural dimensions have dominated attitudes and services. So we're acknowledging that we live in a very structured society in terms of um, who gets to rule which spaces. And it may not necessarily always be written down. It may be in the behaviors, the movements, the attitudes, and sometimes there might be blind spots that we may not be aware of that are inherently heteronormative. So in summary, reproductive rights are centered around the legal right to access reproductive health care services for all people. We've already started this, this discussion before in that we've mentioned how the Trans University Forum found that in universities, trans students struggle to access health care services for their reproductive needs because they, know, they are no competent services and the referral services do not be, tend to not be conducive to them seeking this health care. Right, so a more extensive way of understanding reproductive just justice would include the right to decide if and when to have a baby and to parents' children in a safe environment and healthy community, access to abortion, menstrual dignity, safe and accessible contraception, including condoms, and to all types of violence as this would impact people's reproductive lives, transgender and intersex men and women, as well as binary, non-binary, and genderqueer people in this, when we're saying we're seeking reproductive health justice, we need to ensure they access, 
their access rather to quality reproductive sexual and gender confirming health care without shame or stigma. And just a footnote or a note now, we find that in facilities, not just in students' um, health care services, them, students who are queer or students that are gender non-binary are pathologized. So this is a term that you use when you say that people are being made to be seem to be sick or ill, that they're a problem, instead of being helped through the process um, in a form of normalizing the sort of experiences that they have. So that was something that definitely came up when we did research with um, the SJB, and it's also being um, explored in different spaces. It also means access to quality nutrition and maternity care for all pregnant women. This is not just limited to university students, by the way. You can copy and paste this for your research in future. It's a broad um, explanation of just reproductive health justice, not just for students. It's also the right of queer people to have children and families. It's paid maternity leave and free quality childcare for those working outside of home. And it's also very importantly, but not last, not least, the right to treatment for HIV and STIs, especially when these affect fertility. All right. So just going on a bit about reproductive health justice, we can say that regarding the access to reproductive health services, overwhelming data on a study assessing transgender access to campus healthcare conducted by the Trans University Forum, as mentioned before, found that, and I quote, campus health services are lacking in best practice for treating transgender diverse patients. Interestingly, this is at odds with the observation in other public institution where the work of civil organizations is having considerable influence in how healthcare is provided to transgender diverse persons. If I can just comment there as well, some of the findings from the social justice barometer were that students are aware that there are organizations, units, um, and departments on the university that are geared towards addressing the issues that come up, the issues that we actually brought up as well. And they did say that we acknowledge those centers and environments. But they also mentioned that we need to then separate between all these different, it's not a university-wide commitment. It seems that there are departments and units that are lacking in these inclusive practices. So some of these services include hormone-related treatment as well as mental health, but with very little research being conducted on the accessibility of reproductive health services for transgender people in university spaces. When I read the documents by the Trans University Forum, one of the quotes by the students was from a university in the Eastern Cape. And what they said is they had gone to a healthcare professional, um, a psychologist rather, that was being provided by the university. And what had happened is they had shared that they are considering having, um, yeah, so they would consider, they'd considered that they want to go through the process of changing their gender. They felt that they were transgender and they wanted to go through the process. And what happened is that psychologist referred them to a psychiatric hospital. And they were like, but I'm not crazy. And that speaks to some of the experiences that trans people will face. They'll be pathologized. They'll be made to feel as if they're ill. And this is part of reproductive health justice in that healthcare systems that are not competent, that are not inclusive, that are not aware of the experiences of trans students and trans people will run into the will run into the problem of um, excluding people from reaching these services which are available. So that was something we definitely noted in our work as well, but also in the study by the Trans University Forum. Further research shows that transgender people have unique sexual and reproductive health needs that require healthcare providers in institutions to be receptive and knowledgeable in order to provide accurate assistance and avoid embarrassment and humiliation. Some of these issues include the consumption of cross-gender hormones unsupervised, which may have adverse health effects. When we speak about the embarrassment and humiliation aspect, it reminds me of the SRHR conversation we had yesterday, where young women will not go to a facility for the fear of the embarrassment and humiliation. The speakers did share that parents will feel like, oh, I would die if my child told me they were having sex. But then if they go to these facilities, they also face that same parental um, sort of power where health, health professionals will make them feel as if, oh, wow, this is my mom. And they will shout at them and it will cause this embarrassment and humiliation. So this is definitely not a problem linked specifically to um, a particular people, but this was something that specifically came out in these instances that we've spoken about. Right. 
reproductive health justice. So a recent study conducted in KZN stated that where sexual and reproductive health needs of trans, trans community, of the trans community are involved, the guidelines must include contraceptive strategies and routine health checks targeted at the transgender community to minimize harm because of the illicit hormone usage, um, the binding of breasts, and tucking of female of male sexual organs that could be dangerous to the person if they're not guided and if they're not advised properly. So in a discussion as well that we had uh, with the students, we found that um, some students will say that they will end up experimenting with different ways of dealing with their identity. Um, you also have on social media, um, or rather a show, I'll be very honest, <laughs> I watched a show where, um, and I've actually then read up on people who would, in a moment of trying to reaffirm their gender, would try to remove their genitals, would try to, um, very dangerous practices, they would try very dangerous practices to try and reaffirm themselves because they don't find that they're safe spaces to help them reaffirm their gender and try to get their bodies to fit, you know, how they feel about who they are or how they identify. So it's really important, it's not a trite thing to consider things like the binding of breasts, there's processes for this, and the tucking of male sexual organs, which is usually for a more androgynous appearance. There's definitely safe ways of doing this, there's definitely um, uh, dangerous ways of doing this, and it's very important that when we're busy teaching people how to wear female condoms, for an example, how to wear condoms, that we include this as well, because it's part of reproductive health rights, I mean, or reproductive health justice, both. Right, so part three is sexual justice. And we can say that sexual justice is, let me just read from the screen. Government policy in every country in the world legislates on and seeks to control sex between its citizens in one form or another. So what I want to say is sexual justice seems to be more controlled by the states than we would like, obviously. And what happens is laws and policies that support sexual rights or restrict and punish sexual practices sexual practices and relationships is of crucial concern. So what I was trying to say is sexual justice, as much as it's an individual effort, it's group effort, it's got different facets, the state really plays a huge role in how people then go about accessing or being restricted in terms of sexual justice. And this also came up yesterday when Mrs. Noma Pagate was mentioning policy, and she was sharing that indeed we have NGOs, we have civil societies fighting for people to have access to different sexual, reproductive health and rights needs um, and opportunities, I suppose, but we do have a problem because policy is lagging behind. So what happens is sexual justice exists when people have the power and resources to make healthy decisions about their bodies, sexuality, and reproduction. Right, so it refers to a sexual diversity where people can define themselves in terms of sexual orientation. This includes identifying as gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, and not imposing on the self or having imposed on your own self a sexual orientation um, defined by other people. So it's a very much personal process, but it is definitely influenced by outside factors, people like socializing agents, the media, the church, the family. But in a, in a sexually just world, we hope that people would be able to define themselves um, and not be having any impositions on their identity um, at all. Um, so it's having their self-definition recognized as valid. It's also organizing or having the ability to organize their sexual lives and relationships in self-defining ways. So they can be polyamorous, belong to BDSM worlds, engage in casual or long-term relationships and encounters. It's also hoping for them to have sexual lives and relationships that are recognized as valid, sexual pleasure and a sexual life that's also recognized as valid, and also set up living arrangements which are congruent with their sexual identity and practices. So there's a term called stealth, which is when people who are transgender will prefer to live as um, to live differently to how they identify. So it's a bit like... I'm not going to use the terminology, but um, yeah. So stealth is basically when someone chooses to live a particular different way to how they identify, but they are aware that they do not identify how they are presenting per se. 
And when we're talking about sexual justice, it's acknowledging that that is someone's personal process. We cannot impose how we want them to appear. It's also their stage. The most we can do as people, as institutions, is to create safe spaces for people who would like to um, express themselves to do so in a safe space. So yeah. All right, and then a key concept before we conclude, intersectionality. For people who are in the humanities, you may have come across this term. Intersectionality is basically speaking to groups of people having a common identity, but also then having different facets that define them, and in most cases will exacerbate the injustices that they suffer from. So whether it be gender, sexuality, religion, race, or many of the other defining aspects of identity, there exist intra-group differences. So I might identify as a woman, but I'm also black, but I'm also from a particular demographic and community. Kumalo spoke about Mlazi, gave us a shout out, I'm from there, right? And that would mean being from a township as well, my experiences might be different to someone from an urban area, which is someone, in, which is something that someone in the Zoom chat box also mentioned that there's a divide when it comes to SRHR access for people in rural and urban areas. So what this means is when we look at intersectionality, it's one of the concepts we can use to try and understand better injustices and to work on them. Because we can't say we're dealing with women specifically. We can't say we're dealing with men specifically. There's substrata or subgroups. There's different characteristics under those um, different communities. So we might identify right now as students, as um, gender activists as um, sexual justice warriors, but there are different facets that then make our experiences a bit more unique, right? So yeah, that's intersectionality. Again, put it in your essays for humanities. It's very important. So sweeping generalizations about the struggle of power or of particular social groups fail to recognize that individuals in the group also belong to other social groups and may experience other forms of marginalization. Right. So just to conclude on the social justice barometer, <coughs> excuse me. So as the outcome of the barometer is not to actively condemn an institution, one cannot make statements of whether gender justice, reproductive justice, and sexual justice have been denied or achieved in certain, certain circumstances. Rather, those areas of concern have been highlighted and they need to be attended to. So that's the action part. And we're very big on taking out justice and making it into actionable work where we go out and then do something about it. So this conversation is very important, but we do take the views, the opinions, um, and the concerns and translate them into actionable work that addresses these issues. So inequalities and social injustices are driven by a complex range of factors and can either be inherited or circumstantial. Demographic, demographic factors like gender, sexual orientation, educational level, and HIV status can cause or worsen inequalities. In some cases, for example, we have educational levels that can also contribute to both the outcomes um, and the causes of inequality. So if we could have an example for an example, um, if we can have an example for an example. When I got to UP, my supervisor, she shared something very interesting with me. We were talking about inequality and we were discussing the participants I would have for my master's research. And she mentioned something really, oh, man, it feels so, but it's, it's, I found it profound in a way. She said that at the university, right, if you're in a university, already by virtue of you being in that space, you are a privileged person, right? And I was like, no, but Catherine, you don't know what I had to do to get here today. And she's like, yes. And if you think back to using intersectionality where you came from, right? So if you would say I'm a poor student, for an example, I came from a rural township, access um, to higher education seemed like a dream but you did make it, and there are still some people who would see you as a person in the university space, as a privileged person. So what am I talking about there? I'm talking about those being some of the issues that we need to be aware of, that yes, you can be in a particular space, but using intersectionality, we can understand that that does not mean that um, you can speak for all of the girls who live in Blasey, for an example, because those would be different experiences. You're now a university student who occupies a privileged position, right? So bringing it back to here. So education level and HIV status can also cause or worsen inequalities. In some cases, um, we have higher learning institutions being nurturing grounds for future leaders in countries. And as a result, 
um, social justice plays an immeasurable part of promoting and working toward um, a society that celebrates diversity and equality. So very much self-promotional, but the Just Leaders program is one of these very important programs that seeks to do this actively. We don't just have these conversations, we then go out and do community engagement, we disseminate research, we continue the conversation, not just in 11 days or one day, but constantly, even in December, during the holiday time. So the social justice barometer and the experience of students should be taken as a learning ground to continuously improve on as many aspects that lead to a just and equitable society. And that's what we were trying to do with the social justice barometer with the SJB. So through strategies such as the first year seminars and conversations, Activism and consciousness may lead to a snowball effect where people learn and challenge discriminatory practices, especially against people that, across, that identify across the gender spectrum and not just the gender binary. And I know I've mentioned quite a few groups of people that may be um, on the fringe of society that are marginalized, but it's not just sexual issues that we're worried about. Disability access well is something that we do concern ourselves with. So these are all important ways. And one way to understand it is, oh no, because some people might even ask, but why do we have to care about trans people? Why are we caring about women? Why are we? It's about making a space or a society that is as inclusive of as inclusive as we can make it, right? So if we have an issue and we have, for example, from the SJP comments, um, reflections on the fact that you, we only get visibility for queer people um, and gender diverse people in one week, that is a problem, right? Because they don't live in one week, right? Or we hope they're not gonna live for one week and then leave us, you know? What we're hoping is that we'll have a space that's going to cultivate converge, conversation, understanding, and not just tolerance. Tolerance is not enough. We need active respect. We need active commitment to recognizing people and respecting them in each space that we say we occupy. So definitely that's what the SJB was trying to basically um, highlight. And what we were hoping is that documents could be used by different, not just university, but unit spaces, departments, to see how far they are from making their spaces inclusive, right? And some people might say, oh no, but we're stretching things a bit. Then you can't say that you're inclusive, that you are a just space, that you are active in trying to, you know, not discriminate against people. What we hope the document would do, um, or the instrument rather, is to help people commit towards trying to make their spaces more inclusive. Keep repeating the word inclusive, it's very important. Right, and then I'm just gonna bring your attention to one particular policy instrument at the University of Pretoria that has been very important um, and, and, and it's, 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 it's a keystone of sorts because um, it really does go beyond the anti-discrimination policy that is already existing. It's called the Transgender Protocol and we've got online and some of our speakers, um, Tarun and I do, who are part of the team that worked on developing the Transgender Protocol. So what the Trans Protocol is, is a guideline to strengthen and support the anti-discrimination policy of the University of Pretoria. It's directed towards the eradication of discrimination against transgender or trans intersex students and staff um, who also would be gender non-conforming um, or non-binary members of the students and staff body. Right. And it works towards building a positive and affirming environment. It's being presented to the university's Institutional Transformation Committee for consideration as an approach to support trans, intersex, gender, non-conforming and non-binary students um, and staff in places where they live, study or work. It suggests specific steps to engage with places of residence, study and work to build support for staff and students. So what the document basically, or the policy rather says is provide, it's a bit more specific in what it provides. So um, it sets out how people have the right to then self-define um, their pronouns as well. At UP, you're not able to change your pronouns under your profile at the university. And there's definitely other practices that are being promoted to try and create a more inclusive um, space for trans people and gender non-binary students and staff and our visitors as well. So as I mentioned before, we had um, the protocol being initiated by the peer broad, who is our deputy director at the CSANG, as well as um, the staff at the SOGI S unit at the Center for Human Rights. We also had the Department of Residence Affairs and other stakeholders coming together to make it a reality. 
All right, cool. We've got the background on screen, um, and I'm just hoping that you will continue to read up on the trans protocol, whether you are at the University of Pretoria or not. And I know that research is underway to understand how other universities are prioritizing people that continue to be marginalized in these spaces, right? So UP, as stated in the anti-discrimination policy, is committed to an inclusive, affirming, and transformed institutional culture curriculum campus and residence life. So this is basically taking all of these spaces into consideration and what the trans protocol does is go through all these places, places and try to create um, a way forward or to sort of pinpoint um, problematic areas where developments can be made by in the in the lecture theater or online um, on campus in residence life and in the general institutional culture. All right, so final remarks would be, the Just Leaders Program fosters leadership and awareness. I'm not gonna lie, our volunteers and our team do a great job. And this presentation was actually a collaboration, a collaboration, a collaboration with an, a team of researchers that we worked on with this year. And yeah, so we do a, quite a bit of work to try and make these conversations a reality. Um, and we also then use the social justice, we used past tense, the social justice barometer to recognize the reality um, and also to understand how then, what our work going forward could be. So the important thing that I hope came out is trans rights or human rights. It's not a by the way thing and I tried to prioritize it in this conversation um, so that we understand that that's where we are, right? It may be an uncomfortable situation for people who don't understand, but I'm hoping that you got a bit of knowledge from me giving you a bit of the terminology at the front to me giving you direct examples and quotes from research to policy to my little tidbit about shows that I watch where people try and do dangerous things to themselves in order to gender affirm, to now where I'm now mentioning how the social justice barometer and actual instruments highlighted these issues. We need to know that trans rights are human rights. And then the transgender protocol is the policy instrument that initiates change. Because we did hear from yesterday that policy really does play a role. It could either lag behind, I've never heard someone saying, Oh no, actually they do say our constitution is progressive, but um, policy might lag behind, but it also might be too ahead, but the action that the policy sort, seeks to sort of highlight will be what's lagging behind. So trans protocol is actually a big step by the university to try and address some of the issues that trans people um, suffer from or are marginalized according to. And again, inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. I kept mentioning the word inclusive, because we might tout it around, but there's quite a bit of work to do in trying to make our spaces a bit more inclusive. Thank you so much. All right. No questions this side? Yes. We've got a question this side. Please, can you get her the mic? Somebody. Um, with regards to what you said about healthcare workers, can we not say maybe the issue isn't their ignorance, but it's maybe that they're homophobic <laughs> or they just don't want to be inclusive and not say not say that maybe they just haven't had enough training, blah blah blah. Let's like stop making excuses for people who should just know better. Thank you. Would you like me to answer? Okay, I can answer for now. So I'm growing in the space of understanding the context of healthcare workers. It's not research that I've done on my own. Um, but from personal experience, you would find that, and working with social workers, um, so secondary information, you'd find that it's the way we socialized. So with people who are, and I know it's because <laughs> you are at the center, with people who are not in these um, gender affirming spaces, who aren't in these inclusive spaces, for them, how they were socialized tends to be how they continue going forward, right? And if there's not enough conversation, if there's not enough um, push from civil society organizations that are trying to do this hard work of trying to create awareness around the people that are on the fringe of society, you'll find that resistance because it's just like, but wait, but like what? But that's not how I was raised. 
You know, that's not how I grew up, right? So from just a personal perspective, I think it's a matter of we're fighting a very big system. We're fighting years of people being raised a particular way, people being excluded, and people seeing people being excluded, and then being like, okay, so it's cool to exclude these particular people. And when we talk about situations like this, um, I was staying with a group of young kids earlier on in the year, and I reminded them of, because it, it's also the normalization of this homophobic behavior, transphobic behavior. Um, and I hope I'm not promoting someone to go do terrible things, but when I'm trying to make people realize how ridiculous homophobia and trans transphobia is, I give them examples of, way back in the day, left-handed students and albinos. You know, in different communities, schools, and cultures, left-handed people were beaten up and they were forced, they were seen as wrong and evil for writing with that hand because there was that whole conception by a whole community, whole societies that there's something very, very wrong and we would need to correct this child into writing with their right hand, right? And of course now it sounds ridiculous, like, I will, guys, you know? And also with albinos, we still have issues where um, albinos are still being um, suffering quite a bit of violence and inequality in different communities. But in the South African context, it's starting to be a bit of a more ridiculous concept to think, but why, why would they do anything to an albino based on their skin color? You can't control that, you know? So those just two examples, and please call me out if I'm being problematic, but it's just to help people understand just how ridiculous it is to see a person a different way, but also to understand that the bigger issue we're dealing with is society and our socializing institutions, the media, our families, the church, um, the groups we're into, um, the chat box we're into, hey, what's that as well, what TikTok, the spaces you're into sort of foster this problematic behavior. And it's very difficult if you're not in a space that actually calls you out on your problematic ways. It's very difficult to sort of make that change. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. If someone else would also like to answer, please let me know. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Basi. Um, hi. Okay, <laughs> I always like to check if it's working. So I think maybe just before I comment on a lady's presentation, also to answer your question, I think it's very important to note the difference between an, a homophobic individual who is being homophobic or transphobic in their spare time, in their life with people that they interact with on a one-to-one -one basis, and people who form part of an institution who speak to the institutional culture of homophobia or transphobia. And I think that um, when people discriminate against others in the course of their work, it speaks to an environment, a workplace environment that enables them to perpetuate these discriminatory attitudes which eventually lead into discriminatory practices. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I can't speak on behalf of trans people, but from the trans people in my life who have shared like their experiences with me, is that there is often very crucial misunderstandings in how healthcare workers perceive um, gender and gender expression with your biological anatomy. And Anatomy. Anatomy yeah. yeah. So I think the healthcare profession itself, because there isn't that clarity, because there aren't those clear statements as to how to work with trans or intersex patients, how to work with non binary patients, mm. there is this othering and um, often misgendering and often this minimization of the experiences that you go through that relate to your body mm. because you house your person within your body. Mm. So when your body is being disrespected or discussed in a way that feels uncomfortable to you, it's an attack on your personhood. So I think that you know when we think about people in positions where they can have such a Power. harmful impact mm. on people, like to be like the person is homophobic almost minimizes the role of the institution in regulating that person's behavior as they perform their job. You know, So I think it's very important to look at how environments enable that culture and how like an individual can be raised in a certain way, 
But when you're confronted with information, when you're confronted with a set of guidelines as to how to conduct yourself, yet you continue to perpetuate that, it means that something is wrong in the environment. And I think that that's also like in South Africa, when you look at other issues as well, like outside of like gender justice, when we come back to the race question, it's very clear that there are certain environments that enable people to racially discriminate, mm. you know? So like if we can borrow from those understandings and bring it into the gender justice space, it can also show us that like we shouldn't minimize people's actions and just assign them to the individual themselves. Because sometimes the employer, the employer is meant to be liable for ensuring that there is a space in which that person can perpetuate these harms against people in on behalf of the institution. So yeah, I think that's like my comments on that. But um, also with regards to the trans protocol, um, I think that you know it, it it's the first document of its kind. And even though I was like participating in the drafting, I wouldn't like, like I can't say it's perfect and that people should just replicate it at other institutions. I think it's very important to look at the placement within your organization or within your place of higher education um, to see what type of policy you'd be able to bring in and also how can you better affirm the rights of people within your space. So I don't think that the trans protocol is going to be the last type of document that tries to solve these difficult questions that we have within the university environment, such as how do we include people better? Like we have the anti-discrimination policy, but the main difference between the anti-discrimination policy and the trans protocol is the anti-discrimination policy is reactionary. So it reacts to a harm that has already been perpetuated, you know, but the trans protocol is proactive in trying to create an environment in which these harms can be prevented. Mm -hmm. So it's the only one that deals with um, that proactive environment and guidelines as to how the environment should be structured, structured and how people should interact with each other. But I think going forward, if we want to create more of a progressive space, we need to look at those questions that we have around how can we better include and how can we better make spaces accessible. So with trans people, it was almost like very clear to identify that it's the lack of recognition. The space doesn't recognize that there are people in this space who are transitioning mm -hmm. and may have different things on their legal documentation as opposed to how they present and how they express themselves. And we need to place priority on the way a person expresses themselves and determines and communicates to the world that this is who I am, as opposed to what their legal documentation may say. But there will be other questions that come up and that have come up in the past that need to be dealt with in this manner by taking a proactive approach to creating and almost regulating an environment, you know. Um, but yeah, so I think that like you know, students at the university really pushed this protocol forward, um, alongside with Pierre and a few other people who were interested. But for the most part, I think that like when it comes to um, the student space and issues that are emerging, it would be really good to see students take up the helm and start creatively solving these issues. Mm -hmm. And even with the trans protocol today, I think that like the events that I've seen being hosted over the year, trying to bring awareness around it, trying to discuss it, almost discuss it, discusses this issue in isolation. So, oh, what is the trans protocol? How can we use it? But not, oh, how can people who are part of another minority communicate a community help push the trans protocol. Like, so I think that's, that's one of the things that I feel like has been missing, that kind of intersectional inclusive discussion around the trans protocol in other spaces and discussing the trans protocol with other allies and partners within the institution, like other stakeholders participating. It's something that has kind of just been taken up by people who are working within transformation um, initiatives within the university and people who are working within gender initiatives. But what about the people who are working for other 
other aims, other initiatives on campus? Why are they not trying to find ways to better promote and better make people aware? Because we know, like being a former student of Up and Out, I know the resistance you face within university spaces, trying to go to um, a specific event and speak about your issues and people will shut you down and be like, no, like deal with that stuff in your spare time. You know, and I'm sure the culture hasn't changed that much in the last like four to five years. So I think it's very important that like more of an intersectional focus is used to promote the protocol and the use of the protocol because the process of how the protocol was created um, will be very useful for other issues that need to be solved on campus. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you said you wanted to comment on the presentation as well. You you could. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think that just about wraps up my presentation. And next, I'll be followed by the lovely Mahosi <laughs> Litimile Leti. And she is a disability, disability and inclusion awareness activist, a sexual health and pleasure consultant. And she'll be sharing about sex and disability. Thank you so much, Leti. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Makhotsi Litimile. Online, I go by Wheels and Toys. Um, my story basically is I'm a 37-year-old disabled woman. I got disabled in 2016, so it's been five years living with a disability. And what has me here in the space is how I used adult toys or in my language vibrators to help myself heal and to manage incontinence and eventually my health overall. So, um, okay, so where to start? So in 2016, I got disabled. Um, I had TB and it affected my spine. And um, when I left rehab after, cause I was there for six months, we were told um, go home and one day, if you can afford it, you can get surgery for your incontinence. Otherwise, you just have to deal with this. So they give you linen savers and um, incontinence pads and catheters saying, OK, so this is your life. And good luck and God bless. Um, <laughs> so uh, for two years, I went back home to live with my parents in Jorvik and trying to live as a disabled woman who's in her 30s who's incontinent. Being, able, being unable to travel, for one, being unable to go out because you don't feel anything and you can't tell when you need to go to the bathroom. It led to a lot of embarrassing you know, situations, as you, as you can imagine, you know, because when you're out there and you're disabled and you're having an accident, nobody's going to come and, expect, and say to you, okay, so I think something is wrong. But they will stare at you and point, you know, and make assumptions without wanting to understand that it is a condition. And um, I couldn't make peace with that. So in 2019, I relocated to Cape Town and I was gifted a, a bag of second hand vibrators by a friend of mine. And they said to me, you should try these and let me know how it works. Being that for them to suggest that for me was I was online looking at electronic ways to try and regenerate the nerves because I thought if I can feel some kind of way with my upper body, I should be able to maybe retrain my nerves and sensitize them again because there was a lot of damage that I experienced in 2016. So a friend of mine was on some, I'm not sure if this will work, so try it and let me know what works. And um, I started using vibrators. It was a very strange experience because I had to get comfortable with my body as a disabled person and get comfortable with pleasure. That's the other thing. And trying to make sense of how something so pleasurable is actually helpful for me. And I always tell how six weeks after I started using vibrators consistently, I was able to sleep through the night 
without any accidents. There was no leakage. There was nothing. I woke up in the morning and my bed was dry. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> as a 35-year-old woman, you're like, oh, wow, my bed is dry. Amazing. Um, and I decided if I can experience this and this is what happens to me, and I thought about all the roommates that I was sharing the space with as a disabled person in rehab, thought, if this happened to me, what are the odds that it can help other people? And I started having the conversation online about incontinence and vibrators. And I've since learned that not it's not a, incontinence is not a gendered thing, you know, and um, you don't have to be disabled to deal with incontinence. For whatever reason, you could be struggling with it. And now my, my mission is to try and find as many people as I can and try to get them onto vibrators and say to them, try this for six weeks and let me know how it works. You know, um, so the, the medical interventions that were given to me as an option was Botox and surgery. And as a poor black South African woman, as a disabled black person in South Africa, being able to afford surgery that would be considered vain, because when you go to, to the hospital and you say, I want to get Botox for, for my incontinence, it's not something that's considered an important health matter, you know. But because it's also something that is mostly admitted to by women, I can only talk about the experiences that I have with women, that it's only the women that will speak to me about their incontinence and the problems that they're having, you know. and we know how underfunded women's health is, you know. So when you go to, to, a, to a urologist as a woman and you say to them, for instance, I went to my, to my doctor earlier this year, 20, 21 February, and I said to my doctor, so I've been using vibrators for like two years. It's helped me with my incontinence. It's helped me with my bowel movements. And it does help me with my physical strength as well. How come when I left rehab in 2016, you told me about how to manage incontinence by wearing continence pads and buying more linen savers and, and you know using my catheter, and you never gave me the option to use pleasure to find health? You know, and my urologist said, yeah, well, it's because urology has mostly been a dominated industry by men, which is not surprising. So women's health matters when it comes to urology are not something that is considered. And when you think about disabled women and how just your existence as a whole is not something that is considered, you see how that implies how many women are forgotten because they have incontinence problems. <laughs> Excuse me. So I started talking about it and um, now I'm trying to get everybody on this vibrator train. <laughs> because um, having to relearn my body, because disability can happen at any time. That's the other thing. It's a zero sum game. I was a healthy 30, well, I considered myself healthy, 32 year old. My life was together, so to speak. Um, disability was not something that I foresaw in my future. So this is something that I've had to adjust to and learning to live as a disabled person in your 30s is a very different experience, especially when you don't have the privilege to accommodate yourself in a very inaccessible world, you know. And earlier you were talking about health workers and how people need to be educated. Some of my relatives are, are healthcare workers and are people who used to be nurses. And I remember when I got home in 2016, I'm disabled, and one of my aunts was a nurse, and she said to me, so how are you going to have sex? <laughs> I'm thinking this is a woman in her uh, 50s or 60s who's asking me, who's worked in the health sector, who's asking me how am I going to have sex as a disabled person? So I, I know that there's a misconception that once you become disabled, your sexuality as a whole disappears. You know, just myself speaking as 
a woman who's out dating and saying to people, yes, I want to date and I'm sexy and I want to have sex, people are always on some, but you're disabled. I'm like, yes, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's not something that I can wake up in. And I've been asked if I take my wheelchair everywhere. This, just to answer everybody, yes, I take my wheelchair everywhere. Except for bed, you can put it next to the bed, but I don't get the luxury to hide my disability. You know, so my incontinence couldn't be a secret and it couldn't be something that I could um, hide and conceal. And I can only imagine women in the rural areas, women in war-torn countries who are living as I was and nobody's saying to them, actually, there's a way for you to get help and there's actually a pleasurable way for you to get the help that you need. So I want to be giving disabled women vibrators for free everywhere in the world because we need pleasure and it heals. And I say this as my, I use my body as the experiment and the research to find out what vibrators can do. It's also given me an opportunity to redefine what sex means and heterosexuality focuses so much on genitalia when you're talking about sex. And people will talk about, you know, how our vaginas are supposed to be and things like that. But there is so much more to sex. And if you were to look at the sexual aids that a lot of able-bodied people are using, especially in the BDSM, sex, the BDSM sector, I actually, uh, mobility aids that were a lot of the times designed or um, encouraged by people with disabilities. So when people are talking about sex and sexual freedom and sexual expression, oftentimes they are not talking about the disabled people. Um, I think because of an expectation that we are not, you know, able-bodied, then I don't know what where the, the, the sexuality ends. Um, I've had conversations with people from schools where they are teaching or special, uh, special needs schools, as they call them, and I've been asked to come and, and give convers um, talks about uh, sexual health and sexual AIDS, and um, I've asked that before I can start talking to young people about sexual health, I need to speak to the parents and for them to understand that just because your child is disabled, it doesn't mean that those growing stages of being a teenager and going and having your hormones and being racy, they don't skip that just because they're disabled. They're still going to experience that. And we need to be able to be in a space or to have spaces where you can accommodate disabled children who are, are coming into themselves because oftentimes, not even as children, as disabled people, we don't have pleasure spaces. You can't, as a disabled person, the likelihood of you living on your own is very low. If you live with your parents, the likelihood of you dating is another thing that they will, they might, you know, consider it, but bringing it into life is another thing. Having a partner over, I mean, as an able-bodied person saying, I have a boyfriend, you know, who's coming to sleep over, is a whole thing. So imagine as a disabled person, you're saying, I met somebody and they want exactly, <laughs> and parents are on some note, but you know, what do you want to do? What do you know about sex? So in their own fears and in wanting to protect their children, they're also depriving them of such an important human experience, you know, that everybody has. So human sexuality is why we're all here, you know, and we should be able to have sex for pleasure as disabled people. and we should also be able to have children as disabled people. I'm a mother to a 15 year old. And um, before I started tweeting about my experience on, online about incontinence, I had to have the conversation with Amo to say, okay, so this is who I am. So I got disabled at 32, my daughter was 10. And um, so she got to see how my life was interrupted by my disability. So she got to see how I had to deal with the incontinence and I had to deal with how my life was being held or was actually being interrupted by my inability to control my own bodily function. So 
as I was experimenting with pleasure toys, I had to speak to my kid and say, okay, so this is what I'm doing. I'm talking about vibrators online. I'm writing about it in the city press. Your friends might see the articles and they will make fun of you because that's what human beings do. But I want you to be able to come to me and talk to me about anything that they say to you because I'm not doing anything wrong. But because she had been there when I got disabled, she got to understand that this is my way of getting better, you know. It's really changed and it's improved our relationship because now my kid tells her friends to tell their parents to get in touch with me to buy the vibrators, you know. So it's a conversation that's always ongoing with my daughter. And uh, I'm hoping that it's a conversation that we'll keep having with other people because every time I go outside, I say, oh, yeah, I use vibrators and it helped me with incontinence. People are surprised. Some people are disgusted. And it's unfortunate that in as much as we're so obsessed about sex, we, we, we put it in everything. I mean, you can't even meme anything without it being turned into a sexual thing. But the moment you start talking about how this thing that everybody's always talking about is actually interrupting your life and it's decreasing the quality of your life because if you don't have pleasurable sex, that's also another thing that decreases the quality of your life because bad sex really sucks, you know. So, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> so being able to talk about it is, is one thing I appreciate. The um, irony about COVID is that it brought the conversations online and it made me aware of how lacking we are of basic sexual education, um, not only as a country, but as adults. Uh, so when you're talking about having conversations with children and having conversations about disability and sex with children, we need to start right at the top. We have great policies, yes, until you become disabled. I mean, having recently learned that even with the criminal justice system, um, ableism is not considered a crime in South Africa. So when somebody does something that impacts me negatively, I can't report it. And if I do report it, they don't know how to prosecute it. So there's a white paper currently out, as far as I know, trying to curb the hate crimes that disabled people experience. Um, if I were to be a victim of sexual violence, I live in South Africa, and it's one of my biggest fears because I'm a dating woman, I'm actively dating. I always fear that should I invite somebody into my home and they'll violate me and I have to go to the police station and say, okay, so this is what happened. I can only imagine the kind of questions that they're going to ask me. First of all, what am I doing dating? And two, what was I doing inviting somebody into my space knowing that I can't defend myself? Because I've heard worse things being asked to people who can defend themselves, who've been assaulted, so I can only imagine what will be said to me. Um, so my work is, is multifaceted because I've realized that in as much as I wanted to focus on disabled women and sexual pleasure and sexual health, all the conversations around disabled, disabled people also need to keep going, you know. And my focus might be on sexual matters, but there's so many other things that are linked to our sexuality and to our health as disabled people that we need to be talking about. And I'm going to share a very personal story with you guys. But if you follow me on Twitter, you know I share personal stories everywhere. So, <laughs> so, um, when uh, a couple of weeks ago I went on a date and I, I love coffee. I used to own a coffee shop before, prior the disability, I owned a coffee shop and I loved coffee. And um, a couple of uh, weeks ago I went on a date, I had a cup of coffee, I went to the bathroom like four or five times. And two weeks, not even two weeks ago, about maybe eight days ago, I ordered a mega coffee from Wimpy. It's huge. And I drank that cup of coffee and I remember sitting there and thinking something is wrong because after an hour of drinking that cup of coffee, there was no need for me to rush to the bathroom. You know, this is something that I never would have experienced three years ago. 
I literally just started drinking coffee properly without having to run to the bathroom two weeks ago. I had coffee this morning. I've been tanning myself. I'm looking at the time. I had breakfast at 8 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock, and I haven't had the need to go and clear my bladder. So this is ongoing research about my body and what I respond to. When we were flying here yesterday, we were stuck in, um, in the plane for a bit. So there was a, a one-hour delay. So as we're flying, I keep counting down, thinking 20 minutes to Jovic. Okay, 10 minutes to Jovic. Because um, my period started mid-flight, so I could feel something. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, God, <laughs> can I not have an accident in a, in a plane full of people? So I called the, the, the hostess over and I said to her, okay, so this is the situation and I think I might need to use the bathroom, but I'm not sure about how much time I will have between getting off the plane and getting to the bathroom without having an accident. So when everybody else is disembarking, can I use the bathroom? And she said, yeah, sure. Five minutes before people, before the plane landed, actually, the hostess came to get me. So as I'm sitting in the bathroom. I'm listening to my body having diarrhea. <laughs> I'm having my periods with my diarrhea. I'm sitting and thinking, had I waited five more minutes, I would have had a horrible accident on the plane. And I could just imagine the story because it would have been written as something completely different. You know, it wouldn't have been something disability related. You know, it would have been a failure and it would have been humiliating, you know. And being able to sit in a plane for two hours and to count down how long I will need before I get to the bathroom because I can feel that there's a change in my body is something I never would have predicted had I not started using vibrators when three years ago, you know. So I'm here and I'm hoping that <laughs> after this conversation, I'll get some money into research because I want to go back to the rehab that I was for six months where I was told to go home and try and make myself look sexy for a partner without being told about how to deal with incontinence and try and get other women who were the same age as me, who were younger than me, who were older than me, who were dealing with incontinence and see if what worked for me can also work for them. Because it's unconventional, yes, but also the conversations in rehab about sexuality were very, very lacking. Um, when we were told about sexuality as disabled women, we were told about how to please our able-bodied partners and how to make sure that we are still attractive to them as people. We are not told about how to deal with our bodies as disabled people because I got in there as an able-bodied person. I left with a wheelchair. There was no preparation on how to exist in this body. You know, I was told on how to exist for men while trying to recover and adjust, you know. So the conversation needs to change as well. How are you talking about sexual health to disabled women who are newly disabled and knowing how much the world values womanhood and mobility because by virtue of me being disabled, I'm considered immediately um, my womanhood is, is Christian because one, I can't express my sexuality in, in how I dress, in how I walk, you know, and for instance, I've always thought, I wonder what it would be like for me to get pregnant while I'm disabled, you know, and having experienced what it's like to get into the clinic and say to them, I think I would like to get some birth control, you know, there's that giggle that nurses give you when you're talking about birth control. And here I was as a disabled person saying, I want to get on birth control, you know, and what's the best birth control for me that won't make me uncomfortable, that won't jeopardize me, or something that won't interrupt me? Because just by being a disabled woman, there's already so much that my body is having to, to accommodate, you know. So the conversation around health it needs to be with the disabled people in the room. A lot of the policies that are, are made, a lot of the decisions that are made about disabled people are not decisions that are made by us or with us. The conversations that are going on in the world are often from other people's perceptions. 
you know, and I come in as a disabled person and say, okay, so this is the conversation that I want to have. But by virtue of my disability, I'm already considered incompetent. So getting funding to try and get research, getting funding to try and do anything that's related to women's health and women's sexuality is one of the most frightening things that I've ever had to come across with, with research and trying to change the conversation. So let's fund women's health, let's fund women's sexuality, let's fund women's sexual pleasure because before a vibrator was a vibrator, it was a Hitachi. Hitachi started producing vibrators when everybody was on some, oh no, this is terrible, they started producing ma machine guns. So the same company that's producing machine guns used to produce vibrators and they don't want to be associated with vibrators today, but they're very proud to be associated with bullets, you know. So that should tell you what, what, what sexual health means and what women's sexual health and, and, and pleasure means to the world. So I'm hoping that we'll keep having the conversation and somebody needs to find um, wheels and toys so I can go and give women vibrators and say to them, you can get healthy and you can find your orgasm at the same time. Um, yesterday there was a mention of how women will be in their 40s having had children and never having had an orgasm. Research shows that out of all the, the groups, Suicide women are the, least, are the least orgasmic people in the world. And I believe that because when I'm talking to, to women, I say, when did you last look at your vagina? They're like, ew. You know, so straight women are not coming, one, as healthy people. So you can imagine as a disabled person, and you're trying to have an orgasm and nobody's listening to that. So let's, 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 let's help women, you know. Let's, let's help women have the conversations. And women need to help themselves come, you know. And, and the shame and the stigma of touching yourself belongs to other people because at the end of the day, your sexual pleasure is your own. And we get shamed for our sex before we even have it. So why not go at it <laughs> while you still can? Because regardless of whether or not you have sex, by virtue of being a woman, you're already considered somebody who's a lesser being. So trying to police yourself, you're already doing a job that everybody else is doing for you. So how's about you just get out of your own way and, and find pleasure, you know? So yeah, I, I think <laughs> I've said enough for now. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Let me see. Yes, uh, yeah, that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leti. That was so informative. <laughs> um, and I think it's so cool that we also fed off some of the themes from yesterday yes, yes. Um, and how this is not just an issue of um, straight women not coming <laughs> it's, uh, um, and how exacerbated the issues seem to be. And the story about the plane was quite an interesting, you know, what's the word, introduction into some of the issues you might face that you, we might take for granted. So we could have been sitting on the plane together and I'd probably be yapping at you <laughs> and you'd be there thinking 20 minutes, 10 minutes. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it, it definitely gives us insight to, into a space which we might not necessarily have information into and we really hope that you felt welcome um, and we appreciate that you felt comfortable enough to share with us um, this experience. Truly are grateful. We're so glad you could travel now. Yay! Yay. Thank you to Dildos! <laughs> yes, um, all right. So I think we have questions online. You don't have any questions online. Um, and did you want to continue with a bit more? Or we actually have one question inside with one of our speakers. I'll just put us on now. Thanks, Naledi. And uh, thank you for such an illumining talk uh, to our speaker. Because I think it, it, it demonstrates a couple of things, right? First, the kind of shame discourses that are associated with sexual pleasure, and a secondary and I think more interesting and more nuanced conversation around sexual pleasure, shame, 
and disability, right? Yes. So this idea that we abled bodies sort of right off uh, differently abled bodies, right? So we're like, we're the only ones who are supposed to have fun. We're the only ones who are supposed to really enjoy pleasure. And in thinking about that, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about, or I'm, I'm curious about the, the kinds of ways in which the conversation around sexual liberation initially begins, right? So at the beginning of the presentation, you indicate that you've got a 15-year-old, uh, and your 15-year-old understands that, for instance, you've been using vibrators precisely for health benefits, but also health that is derived from pleasure, yes. right? Yes. So I wonder if you would care to share with us probable strategies. And it's interesting because, again, you're speaking as somebody who has the experience of both being quote unquote able-bodied and then there's this transition to um, being differently abled and how we can begin from whatever position we're located to have conversations around pleasure and around the idea that pleasure can actually be a healing tool, right? Uh, not only for somebody who is differently able, but just for society, for psychosocial functioning to actually exist in ways that are meaningful. How do we have that conversation with young adolescents in the first respect? I'm um, going back to yesterday's conversation of saying, having that conversation without seemingly saying we're pushing our kids into sex. No, we're not pushing our kids into sex. But if, if, if and when kids become sexual beings, how do they ensure that they're deriving as much pleasure as possible? And more importantly, how do adults actually figure in their minds that this is something, you know, we've got to be proud if we own vibrators, as by an example. <laughs> um, we've, we've, got to be, we've got to explore our bodies and we've got to be intimate with ourselves first and foremost before being intimate with anybody else. How do we have that conversation with our children in the first respect, but more importantly with adults as well. I wonder if you'd care to share about that and your experience specifically with your daughter uh, and your journey. Okay, thanks for the question. That's very interesting. Um, I would say start with the adults because I've noticed that young people are more willing to be receptive of new information. So you start talking to the adults before you start talking to the children. Um, and a lot of people are always ready to be offended. I mean, I, I talk about vibrators and sexual pleasure, and I get shamed a lot. That's the one aspect that I don't talk about, that I get shamed a lot online, offline. People, even people who know me will be like, yeah, but that's disgusting. But those are the very same people who will, who will come to me in the DMs and be on some case, so I've got a problem with this. So, <laughs> so, so I don't, is this you then? Um, once I'm, okay, so tell me what the problem is and then we'll, I'm not a qualified sexual psychologist, anything. I just, I'm comfortable talking about my experiences. And one thing about ignorance is that in as much as we can try and inform people, at the end of the day, it's people's decision on how they decide to receive it. So I start talking to adults, and if an adult pushes back on something as basic as, um, have you looked at your, have you taken a mirror and, and looked at your vagina lately? And they're like, oh no. Then I know that we need to be having a deeper conversation before we even start talking about self-pleasure. So I try and assess how age appropriate it is and then we take it from there. Because um, as one of the speakers yesterday was mentioning, as soon as you are a girl child, when you start developing breasts, it's, it's a big thing. I mean, um, sorry, Amo, but <laughs> my daughter, uh, my daughter is uh, developing and she's a teenager. And um, unfortunately, she's growing breasts. And she, she was telling me how in school, everybody will be, it will be a hot day. Everybody will take off their jerseys. Immediately when she takes us off, she was told, none of this. And she's like, none of what? You know? So already my daughter's being shamed for her body developing and trying to fight that back that, no, there's nothing wrong with your breasts growing. There's nothing wrong with your, with your hips. And you are a growing person. 
So, again, sorry, um, she's my guinea pig because what she experiences, she tells me about it, and then I learn from it. And the conversations that I have with Amu, I'm hoping that I can have with other young people, you know, in a safer space. But um, uh, adults need a lot of sex education. Adults need a lot of basic sex education, and it worries me about how much, uh, how uninformed we are about our bodies. And because it's not a choice that we are uninformed, it's something that is drilled into us from the moment that we're born that we are going to be shamed not only for being girls, but growing into women. So we get prepared to, you grow up, you are domesticated into cleaning, you taught how to, you gendered into a certain box. And um, in all of the conversations that you're taught about how to grow up and how to be a wife and how to be a mother, nobody's telling you about how to be a, a, a person who understands pleasure. You know, so we are taught how to be in existence for other people's benefit, you know. Um, when, for instance, vibrators don't come cheap. Yes, we do have starter vibrators from like 200 rands, but vibrators can cost up to like 60,000 rands. If you've got the money, you know, you can buy anything. And I always notice how if a woman wants to buy a vibrator that costs 1,500 rands, they'll go, ah, but uh, I have to do this. And I feel so guilty spending 1,500 rands on a vibrator. And I always say to them, do you have a partner? They're like, are they male? Do they play PlayStation, whatever? Yeah. How much are they spending on that console and all that games? And they'll start calculating. I'm like, when you think about how much pleasure they get from that, and you're thinking about not swiping that vibrator, you better remember how much it cost you when you spent 12,000 rands on a PS whatever, and then you, you considering and weighing the options about how much pleasure you think you're worth, you know? So we are conditioned to be present for other people as women. Our bodies, we are taught that our bodies belong to others and having to bring the conversation back to ourselves, we have to start with the children because when we teach our children that you have the right to say no, um, somebody else says to them, but saying no to an adult is the wrong thing, you know? So what, what are we saying to our kids? What are we saying to disabled children, you know? What are we saying to disabled women? Because the other thing about disabled children and women that I found disturbing during COVID and reading all these stories is how families were willing to have that disabled family members sexually exploited for money, you know. But if I were to say I'm a sex worker, I'm doing this independently, it would be something that is, is, is shunned upon. I mean, I say this as somebody who, when I say I'm a sex worker, people are like, oh, gross, you know. But Society considers it appropriate to say, okay, so you've got a disabled daughter. You can rent her out, you know, and make some money. She might fall pregnant a few times, but we'll handle it. So our bodies don't belong to us, and disabled women don't belong to themselves. So, yeah, it's, it's a, it really needs to keep going. It really, really needs to be a conversation that's on, ongoing, and I, I'm hoping that it's a, it's a monthly thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a question. All right. Um, should I come up to you? We've got another question from online. I'm just going to go up. Um, the question online asks, how do you deal with ableism directed at you by sexual interests while you're dating non-disabled people? Can you care to ship an example, if any? And um, thanks for the question. <laughs> Um, I'm on Tinder, I'm on Hinge, I was on Bumble, but I deleted it after like a week, it's a terrible life. <laughs> but, um, and because my disability is physical, I can't hide it. Um, October month is observed as a disability, is a mental health awareness month. And then November is disability awareness month. And some people who live with mental health 
illnesses don't consider themselves disabled. So they're able to conceal that disability and um, navigate ableism around those spaces. With me, I judge people on how they speak to me. So the first 10 sentences in the conversation that we're having will determine, like for instance, if you ask me, so do you take your wheelchair everywhere with you? Um, yeah, then I know that this is not the person that I'm needing to be talking to because if you're going to ask me if I'm taking my wheelchair everywhere with me, are you taking your legs everywhere with you? <laughs> you know, so, um, but I try and be graceful to people. I've just decided that I don't educate people on ableism. I'll just tell them, please just go Google ableism if you want to continue the conversation. Um, and trying to navigate the space and not being fetishized because that's the other thing that I'm experiencing as a disabled person who's online dating is that, um, excuse the profanity. <laughs> Everybody's trying to fight the cripple, but nobody wants to be with the cripple. And I just think it's very weird how people will say to me, oh, I think you're so cool. Oh, I think we should, you know, guard for a while. Oh, we should meet. And then we meet and they're like, okay, yeah, so I was wondering, you know, if you wouldn't mind having sex with me, but, you know, uh, it wouldn't be anything serious. So they do try and... and, and take opportunity and, and, and people think just because we're disabled, we don't have standards and we'll accept anything. So when people approach me, 50% of the time is people thinking they're doing me a favor. I've had to actually put it on my Tinder by that you're not doing me a favor by being here. I have options, you know. So reminding people that you might see my disability as something that is a negative, I don't. and by being able to pick up early how somebody speaks to me has saved me a lot of trouble. So I don't, I don't say no twice. It's, it's one of the things that I, I, it's my practice with online dating. If you say something and I say no, that's it. I don't elaborate it, I don't discuss it, I don't say no twice. And if I say no to you and you proceed with wanting to continue the conversation, then you're definitely not the right person for me. Because if I can say no to you on text and you don't listen, what are the chances that you're going to listen to me when we're together physically and I say no? So immediately when I say no to something on text and you try and continue whatever you're trying to continue, immediately I know that it's time to block. So that's, that's, I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you, Faith. Not sure if you can hear me. And thank you, Faith, um, online for also um, asking that question. We've got one more question in the okay. venue. I'm just going to move forward. Giddy. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Um, especially coming from a woman. Um, because um, women's pleasure is something that is actually disregarded. I mean, we can talk, maybe it stems from culture itself, like virginity testing. I mean, if you oh, yeah, are not a virgin, then you are seem lesser of a person. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you are out there and saying all those things and educating us, it means a lot. So okay. yes, thank you. It's a pleasure. And one other thing, being a woman, yes, it comes with a lot of shame. I remember when I was growing up and I started growing breast. So they told me, Hori, I should take Lifielo, like, uh, and, and, and sweep my, 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 my breast. It's amazing so how many of us have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and I'm thinking, at that point, they should just, have just told me, now you're going to be a woman, not be like, no, they should stop growing. Because, like, that's nature. That's just nature. But it came with shame now. I had to hide the fact that I'm growing breast and I'm a woman and women have breasts. It's something that we are, we are taught we are taught to be ashamed of our bodies from true. the moment we're born. True, true. You know, so you growing up the entire time you told it's a girl, cover up, you know, you should, you know, hide that, you know, you shouldn't sit like that. You should sit like a lady. You're virginity testing. So this is you and you've owned your body all these years 
and people think it's appropriate for you to go and if I'm offending somebody, I'm so sorry, but my personal feelings. We're going into this place where I'm going to be naked and lying with my legs spread open and strange women are sticking their fingers in my vagina. And after that, I'm getting a piece of paper that says I'm a woman still. How is that not an evasion? And what gives them the right to determine what womanhood, what womanhood is to me, you know? What happens to the disabled women then? So let's say you're born disabled, you know, and you're going through all of these things. What happens with the virginity testing? Or are you not considered a woman? Do you not get taken for the testing? Because obviously you're disabled, so nobody has sexual interest in you. You know, so those are the con culture. A lot of the cultural practices that need to evolve are harmful to women, you know, and it starts with the conversation. The stigmas and the shame that we carry as women are things that are given to us. The shame that we, the shame that I felt about my body, it came from other people pointing out what's wrong with me. So is everybody's telling me that something is wrong with my body. I'm going to start feeling like something is wrong with my body. And I'm spending all this time apologizing and trying to make right for being in the wrong body by existing as a woman. It's the strangest thing with uh, patriarchy. Thank you. Not really, but yeah. <laughs> so um, being... I recognize the privilege of being able to speak in spaces like this and be welcomed. But I do know that when I go outside, uh, the experience is completely still different. Um, and because people are so hung up on respectability politics, they don't want to be associated with people like me. I'm a disabled woman who talks about sex, you know. So it's, it's um, our country is progressive but we still have a very long way to go. Um, and I'm hoping that with the conversations, not only transitioning from, you know, online, but going outside, I'm hoping that the conversations keep going. It's unfortunate that we have to be the ones that keep reimagining the conversations, but I'm glad that we're able to have the conversations. So, yeah. Thank you so much. We've also got two more questions, mm -hmm. and then we're going to wrap up and prepare for our next session at 12 o'clock. Okay. Mahosi, yes. um, this is my last question to you okay. uh, on, on, on this topic, and, I, and really I'm, I'm incredibly humbled by the work that you're doing because I think it's, it's doing so much and it's opening up so many possibilities for so many people. Um, they must fund me. I'm trying to like <laughs> I'm trying to get money for research so I can buy vibrators and say to women, Okay, so you've got six months here, try it out. Yeah. Let me know how it goes. So they must find me and I'll come back with a different story. <laughs> um, the the one question I have for you is what's your ideal relationality for society with our sexuality? Right? So so when you're seeing, say, maybe 5, 10, 15, 50 years from today, and you're looking back at this conversation, what do you hope are some of the considerations that we will not have to repeat? Right? Let's imagine 2071, <laughs> and we're back at Future Africa I'm as, virtual, <laughs> as virtual avatars. Ah. <laughs> and what is it at that point in time that you hope could have fundamentally shifted around how society engages with sexuality across the spectrum. Heterosexuals, those of us who identify with the LGBTQIA plus community, differently able bodies, abled, what is it, abled bodies, what is it that you hope that can be a standard norm that we would have realized about our sexuality that we ought not to be recycling at that conversation in 2071? I know it's a big question, but I'm curious. <laughs> I would want to say, make sex accessible, make consensual, safe sex accessible um, in, all this, in all the ways. When we're talking accessibility, make sex 
accessible to even those that you think are not worthy of it. Because even when we're talking about sex within all these groups, there are still those that, even as disabled people, there are people that say, you're too disabled to have sex, you know. Make sex accessible, but also give people the right or allow people the freedom to actually enjoy sex. We spend so much talking about sex with others and enjoy sex with yourself. That's my big, big thing, that we are not enjoying sex with ourselves. When we are imagining pleasure, we're imagining other people's pleasure with our bodies. So imagine pleasure for yourself and want pleasure for yourself. Center yourself in your pleasure before you can consider including other people. And for me, my disability, in as much as it has excluded me from a lot of the um, dating scenes, like I wasn't dating for four years post my disability. I only started dating in my fifth year of my disability. And um, realizing how a lot of the sex education that I received even as a young person, it wasn't about me, you know. So when I, I'm thinking about what makes good sex, I'm always thinking about what makes a good sex for the next person. So let's center ourselves, you know, before we, we include others in the pleasure. So yeah, that's the conversation I'm actually hoping that we'll be having, that we're having sex that pleases us and very shame-free and stigma-free sex would be divine. Um, uh, when COVID started, I said that I'm looking forward to the sexual revolution that's going to hit post the vaccines, our lives when we're all safe to go out. And uh, it didn't have to wait for COVID to be managed, but people were already living that best sex lives because time is up, you know? <laughs> so have the sex now, not because of COVID, but have it because sex is fucking great when you do it well. You know, so yeah, I've never met anybody who was eight years old and they were saying, ah, I regret having all that sex all those years ago. Nobody has ever said that. So, <laughs> but I have met women in the 60s who have said, I actually should have fucked more when I was younger. So get on with it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, mine is just a very small question, um, but I wanted to know how, um, well, because, you know, things like, um, having sex when you're living with a disability or people who are outside of like the normal conception of human sexuality. So things like kink, BDSM, um, polyamory, group sex, group play, like that's not often included in general discourse around, you know, healthy sexual practices and feminist sex practices. Like how do you think we can bring more focus and more visibility and like especially like as able-bodied allies, um, how can we create that space for people who are living with disabilities to talk about sex more and for people to understand how to respect and how to treat their partners who may be living with a disability when it comes to sexual interactions outside of relationships? The only way to, thank you for the, for the question, the only way to, to get a change is to keep the conversation going. So invite disabled people into the conversation, invite them into um, your um, discussions, invite them into the room. Um, the was World Sexual Health Organization 2021 declaration was nothing without us, you know, nothing without us, nothing about us without us. So don't talk about disabled people and leave it there. Because you are already aware as an able-bodied person and do you know what your circle looks like, reimagine the circle with people with visible physical disabilities. And I need to make the distinction that when we're talking about disabilities, oftentimes we're talking about visible disabilities. Look around you and ask yourself, where are the people with disabilities? You know, when you go back to the office and you go back to your job, when you go back to your classes, ask yourself, because disabled people are 25% of the world's population. They're one point, 
something billion plus disabled people in the world. In South Africa alone, the last statistics which are also needing to be updated, uh, there were about three point something million disabled people. You gender it, it's about 52% uh, of them are women, obviously, but also various disabilities affect women more as they age. You know, because of all the labor that we're subjected to throughout our lifetimes, women get disabled later in life. So have the conversations around the circles and ask where are the disabled people, you know? And if they're not there, where can we find them? Because you can't tell me that you don't know anybody who doesn't know anybody who's disabled. Um, and if you don't know anybody who's not disabled, it's like living in South Africa and having only black friends or having only white friends. If that's your circle, then there's a problem, you know. So start having the conversation and be inclusive. It needs you to be intentional. It needs you to be deliberate. You must actually go out of your way to find people who are not like you and to include them in the conversation and ask. If you have a disabled person in the circle and you're not sure about something, ask the, I love answering questions because I'd rather inform you than be offended by your assumptions. So ask and yeah, just talking goes a long way. I mean, it's because I started tweeting about this that I'm here today. <laughs> Had I not started talking about my experience and it wasn't, it was out of desperation because my talking about my incontinence on the internet was not a desire that I wanted. I don't want to be, <laughs> that was not how I wanted to be known. But out of desperation and lack of information, I decided to get on the internet and start talking about this. So let's reach out. What, who's talking to the disabled women in the rural areas? Who's talking to you know, the disabled women in some village with no internet? You know, They might have SMSs, but this is South Africa, they don't have WhatsApp, you know. So let's talk and, and let's find those people that nobody thinks about. Um, women that get sick get forgotten in the world. Let's find the forgotten women of the world. And, and let's find the disabled forgotten women, you know, and yeah. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. That was really informative. We appreciate the personalized um, aspects to the conversation as well. Themes of affect, emotion, embarrassment, shame, pleasure are coming up on both days and we're truly grateful and uh, we really hope that we get to work with you in future as well and more opportunities come up where you could um, really um, get the funding that you need in order to increase the footprint for the work that we're doing. So thank you so much. That wraps up our session for now. The next section is going to be at 12 o'clock. Please do join us and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Goodbye. Thank you.